And yes, we're back for another great show, Blue Damage. Uh, I am done traveling. That's it. I'm done. I'm done. Lies. lies. It's a lie. Lies, lies, lies. <laughs> Stop trying to I mean, fool us. I'm going to New York on Friday, but I mean, I'm done going out of the country for at least until my birthday. And I'm going to tell you why. I almost got into a fight at JFK mm. yesterday, flying back from Aruba. How did it start? Well, I don't even know how it started. I was on a phone call. <laughs> And I had my three phones in my hand trying to get my luggage. And this is the problem. People have not been out in a long time. And so now that everybody's trying to travel, people have forgotten what it's like to be crowded around the little bin where your your luggage comes out. And (laughs) while I was on the conference call, minding my own business, uh, this guy was in the way. And I said, excuse me, sir. Like, I could tell you have broke luggage. Can you please step to the side? And go wait at the end for the people who have to pick up the luggage with three wheels. You're not picking up the luggage. <gasps> that Can you go over there? I Jason, didn't say this to, come on. I didn't say this to him. I didn't. I don't mean broke in the sense of no money. I mean broke in the sense of he looked like he had disheveled luggage. I said, can you go stand on the other side, sir? I need to get right here because I know my bag is going to come out priority because I'm a priority. And <laughs> oh. but I said it. I said it in a nice way. I just said, sir, can you please scoot over? And he just looked at me. He refuses to move. I see my back coming, so I nudged him. You know, while I'm what? on the call, I, I nudge him, and then I grab my bag. And then when I grab my bag, he has the audacity to say, "Motherfucker, your bag hit me." I said, "Hold on." Now I'm on a business conference call. I said, "Hold on a minute, you guys. Hold on." I said, "Motherfucker, if you don't get your ass back, first of all, you ain't got no mask on. Second of all, I'm not today. Like not today, sir." Wait. You hit him first. No, you no, hit him I first, didn't. Jason. I did not hit him. I you nudged, nudged him. him. <laughs> I nudged him. That was the nice- It's a form of hitting. No, it's a form of hitting. If you Excuse nudge me, me I'm going to nudge you me. back. I had my luggage in one hand, so I was thinking of myself like a football player. I did not want to fumble the luggage, so I nudged Mm-mm. him. That's what they do in the NFL. When they're trying to get through, they nudge. I nudged him. Well, he made this big old scene, and he thought because I was on a conference call, I wasn't going to- you know, act my, mm-hmm. my ethnicity, you know? And so I had to, I had to check his ass. Uh, and then still, as I'm walking out on my phones, carrying my luggage, pulling my luggage, cussing him out on a conference call. It was, a, it was a scene, but nonetheless, I think that people have gone crazy. I think the airports are just <laughs> out of control. I think people have forgotten etiquette. Um, yeah, it's, 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 it's out of control in the airports. So Jason, if, you... if one if one doesn't allow you to nudge them, all etiquette has been thrown out the window. Right. Where's well, the etiquette think... about bone cut crushing somebody and nudging them, Jason? Like I would have hit you. Well, no I offense. think once I hit you. no, no, no. But here's the thing, and this is the problem, and I don't want to sound wrong. <laughs> Too late. White people think they own everything. White people think oh. they own airport. White people okay. think they own airports. White people think they own the air. White people think they own the water. White people think they own the airline. This was a racial thing. Clearly, he was in first class. I was in first class. He had, I think he had an issue with me being in first class because he was looking at me the whole time I sat in my seat. Then he commenced to standing directly in front of me. Now, you see me standing here. There ain't no room unless you want me to fuck you. And you clearly know you're not my type. Big old bottom. Standing right in front of me. And then his wife and his little raggedy ass kids are screaming out of control on the side. So you need to attend to those things, right? I'm standing here minding my own business. I said, excuse me. Black people have to stop being extra begging for respect. Like when I say excuse me, that means excuse yourself to the right. But you choose not to excuse yourself. You see my luggage come out because your raggedy ass luggage, raggedy. I said raggedy. It's coming out over there. So I nudged him in a nice, polite manner. And then that uh, happened. Sir, sir, first of all, you can't be raggedy in first class unless you use your last bit of change to get in there. Although I will say that first class is probably the most racist travel experience I've ever had. Every time I'm in first class, somebody always cuts me, asks me, are you in the wrong section? People have sat in my seat and been shocked. It was my seat, even though their ticket said something different. But like, yeah, no, it is bad. <laughs> it is well, bad in first class. You know what's worse than racist people or elitists in first class? Who? Who? Other black people in first class, because excuse me, because they <laughs> looking be at me, you, Jason. no, because they looking at you like, 
why you show up? I wanted to be the only one. Like, it's always a competition. Like, we, everybody trying no. to roll up and throw their watches. And the girl today, she made sure she sat her little Chanel bag on her purse. I'm like, girl, ain't nobody looking at your Chanel bag. I'm about to go to sleep because I needed to catch up on rest. So I went straight to sleep when I got on the plane today. But yeah, the airports are out of control. Nobody's wearing masks. By the way, everybody believes that the coronavirus is gone. Everybody. And I was at the club. And it ain't. This, I was at the club in Aruba this weekend, and I said to myself, you know what? This is it. This is a new strand out here, too. I'm not getting the Delta. vaccination. Not, yeah, Delta. Like, I can't. And, and, and you know what? I thought, you know, oh, it's a new vaccine, a new strain. I'm sorry. I thought it was some bullshit, too. Everybody's catching it. Like, everybody I know is sick right now. So please uh, do whatever you got to do. I don't know if it's sea moss, echinacea, whatever you got to do, vitamin C, do all that shit right now. All of the not, you, not, that's you what laughing. you need to be on. You that's laughing, you, you laughing, you better listen to damage because that's what people are missing. Damage, I'm glad you said that. People are forgetting all you need to do is keep an, a strong immune system. Take your vitamins. Mm -hmm. Eat, eat, get, make, make sure your gut health is healthy. Take that sea moss. Get your body. Work out. Damage in blue, I'm telling y'all right now. Thoquinox is open. All You're my friends more than on sea moss got COVID. So that's why I'm laughing. But everybody who I know who eats sea moss not, got COVID. <laughs> It's not just sea moss, though. It's the vitamin C. I it's know. making sure you're getting sleep. It's working out. It's changing your diet. Mm -hmm. Like keep our body has natural ways of fighting this thing. I'm not mm -hmm. here at all saying to people that the coronavirus is or isn't real. I have my own theories. And I'm not here to say that it's gone away, even though most of you thought it is. And I'm not here to advocate for the vaccination because I'm telling you, I have not and don't plan to get it. But I'm saying that we do have strong systems that are created by God that we just need to reinvest in and just stop the Chick-fil-A and McDonald's and go eat something healthy and get it together. Like, I don't know, but Damage Blue, I can tell you the world definitely thinks that the virus is over. No, they do. And at the very least, man, just to top off what you're saying, drink some damn water. Aqua. Mm -hmm. Hydrate yourself. Drink water. Stop drinking Pepsi in the morning. I know people drinking lemonade in the morning. Wake up and drink some damn water after you brush your teeth. In the morning? Yes. Yes. Jason, you might have missed it, it but all. last week I was talking about how I had a, I thought it was a date. It ended abruptly because he went to the bathroom and forgot to flush and his pee looked like apple cider vinegar. And I was oh like, I don't God. want that anywhere near me. Whatever brown well, liquid well, is that, coming out well, of is not I coming mean, near me. Blue. So he needs to drink some water. You know who you blue. are. Drink some water, just, bro. Blue, the pro just don't let him pee in your mouth. Other than that, his pee is just a reflection of his hydration level. Jason! Really what, Jason. No, Jason! No, I'm just saying. No, I've had somebody ask me to pee in their mouth. Clearly, I couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. But I'm just saying, like, I learned that urine, literally, the urine color is just a, it's just an identification of urine, like, your, you know, your hydration level. Like, like the lighter yes. it is, the more and hydrated you are. Women have a pH balance, Jason. So we have to be careful about what comes near us so it's not well, just my yeah. water's ph balance is 9.5 i don't know if this can help your ph balance but i don't know just drink more water people and you know i thought about this too the other day not to be gay or nothing i haven't i haven't um, stuck dick in so long no i haven't <laughs> performed oral sex in a long time since i got this new body i've been more into fucking but i have told myself recently i have given I have given a lot of me away. Like I'm also on this new thing of not having sex with people I'm getting to know until I know that I want them. But oh, I dating. Have... Okay. Uh-huh. No, not in my community. <laughs> not not in That's the true. community. <laughs> That's true. Uh-uh. But you know, but I am at a point now where I've gone to two countries with two people to see who I want to date. And I think I know. But then I don't know, because mm, while I was stuff. out, people were still texting everybody. You're with this person. Are you with that person? Oh, they do this. I, I need a peace of mind. I'm at a point in my life where I just want peace of mind. Can I? Is that too much to ask? But do you not yeah. know what you want, though? Because I feel like you should know who you want, regardless of what's happening around you. Probably might be you, Jason. But do we ever know damage, Blue? Do you ever know? Like, Blue, you thought you wanted that motherfucker till you went to go use the bathroom, and then here come his dark ass pistol <laughs> toilet, and he fucked up your whole urinary tract, and you don't want to give him no babies. You know what I'm saying? Like, he almost But died. I knew, though. He almost, yeah. But, 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 Jason, I have a question for you. So, I, I know you're not in a relationship right now, but with one of these guys you're talking to, if you were to go out into a public place and you see them with somebody else getting cozy... It would bother Dancing me. Dancing on them, rubbing on you. 
Well, I've been on all that. That's just being territorial. That doesn't mean you like them. That's just being territorial. But my question is, would you stop talking to them? No, because I don't believe you own anybody ever, but I definitely don't believe a person owes you anything in terms of commitment until they have locked, until you have locked it down. So no, I'm not that Mm -hmm. bad. I do think it would probably motivate me to want them more if I saw that somebody else wanted them because the two people that I have been talking to are desired by a lot of people, but I also don't feel like being in competition. So it's just one of these things where like one day I wake up and I'm like, yeah, I want to be in a relationship. The next day I wake up and I'm like, it's a headache. It's just a headache. So I don't know. And, and, and so let me ask you guys, have you ever had these conversations with yourselves? And I wonder if people watching or listening to the show have ever had this conversation. Have you ever had the conversation with yourself that you may just be alone? for your life. Have you ever had that conversation? I've had the conversation that maybe I can't be with one, but not alone. Not alone. Never been there. Hmm. I'm going to be honest. I've never worried about being alone because people don't leave me alone. I I have, yeah, I've never worried about being alone. I've worried about the quality of the relationship. So I tend to attract a lot of people. I just don't attract people that I feel have enough substance to keep my attention. So for me, it's never about alone. It's about the quality of who's next to me, if that makes sense. But, but, but that, yeah, no, that makes really. sense. That makes sense. And that's my thing. I'm not saying, have you ever reconciled the idea of being lonely? Because all of us are good looking people. We're beautiful black people. We're successful. We're smart. We're in social circles. That brings us around a lot of diverse people. I don't, I don't foresee any of us being lonely. I'm saying, have you ever reconciled with the idea that you may never be in a full partnered, committed situation? Mm. Ah, that's different. Yeah, I actually, yeah, I've had that conversation with myself a lot recently because I actually went to dinner with a group of friends last week and I was like, oh, I'm going to go out. There's going to be cute boys there. Let's see who I meet. And just my luck, I sit next to a gay couple who after 30 minutes of eating with me asked me to have their baby. And I was like, is this what's going to happen? And, and Oops, sorry. I just dropped my phone. I'm like, is this what's going to happen? Like, I'm going to end up being like a surrogate mom for like a, a rich, attractive gay male couple. Like, so yeah, the offers that I'm getting are making me feel like I'm being punked. And that when I'm 50 and my kid <laughs> is like off somewhere at, at college, I'm going to meet my person in my golden years. So I'm starting to be a little bit nervous about when it's going to happen. The when is making me nervous. I hear that. I feel like for me, it's so tough liking people these days. I, I get burnt out. It's like you try to like somebody, what? you want to take them out. You want, it's it's exhausting. For liking all the people fellas is out there, exhausting? I'm, it's exhausting. It is. It's exhausting. It is. To try to court them, to try to get to know them, to try to communicate with them because they probably got all this other shit going on and social media makes it worse. Everybody got all these options. It's real life exhausting trying to get to know people today. So... I mean, I'm good now, but I was at a point where I was like, I'm about to just throw it all all away, not care, focus on getting my money and give up because it'll give you a headache. You think you like somebody and then they end up doing this or that and you're like, what's going on? That's where I am right now. And that's exactly my point. Like I, I'm used to just fucking, okay? If I'm not in a relationship, I'm used to just fucking. Now that I'm trying to get to know these people and saying to myself and to them, I will not have sex with this person. I will not have sex with you until we're together. I'm forcing myself and forced to get to know them and pay attention to them and see if I actually really like them for them. That's new to me. I know that sounds crazy. But at 43, getting ready to turn 44, I'm having these moments where I'm like, Do I want to just lock down and focus on my money and just my success, my business, my brand, my thing, my baby? Do I want to share my world with somebody that I'm I'm building this world? Do I want to share it with somebody? And do I have the time to invest in getting it? Because you're not doing anybody a, 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 a service. You're doing yourself a disservice and that other person if you're really not focused on whether or not they could work for you. You know what I mean? Like Jason, question. Time. I just thought about a question that my friends and I have been arguing about for two weeks now. Now I'm really curious about what what you and Damage think. If you were told, if you got like a prophetic dream from God that you were going to get an amazing, amazing life partner, but it was going to only last for 10 years, it was going to be the most amazing 10 years of your life. I would would do it. it, I would do it. Knowing it wasn't forever. You would do it. I would do it. Damage, would you do it? 10 years. That's it. Life life isn't forever. Of course I would do it. You wouldn't be I'll devastated be that you could. I've been trying to negotiate for year 11 and 12. 
I would try to get because it might not it might not be meant to go on past then. Because I have some past relationships that I look back on. I'm like, damn, I'm so glad I went through that. I'm so glad I met that person, even though it didn't work out. And you know, totality, it was still an amazing experience. So yeah, I would do the ten years because but you, didn't you never know, know that, that person. Though. Knowing is the part that gets me. Not knowing, I'd be cool, but knowing for ten years, I got you for nine years and eleven months. I got you for nine but years. Let me, and 10 ask, let me, fl- let me flip it on you and ask you. Let me flip it on you and ask you this question: If you knew you only had ten years to live, how would you live your life? Right? You should live every life in every That's situation, true. every moment, like it's not going to last. So for me, if you told me I was going to have ten of the best years of my life with a person, like and be in love and have that euphoric mm-hmm. feeling of having some. You know, because the one thing one person did do for me on one of the trips, and I ain't going to say the trip because, you know, whatever. They made sure all my stuff was packed. They made sure I didn't forget anything. They carried my luggage Aww. downstairs. Like, that type of shit is the little shit to me that I'm like, at first Amen. I was kind of like, nah, nah, I can get that. I can get that. But then I was like, yo, that's kind of dope to, like, have somebody look out for you like that and make sure that, you know, I'm I'm taking care of and stuff like that, that, that I miss. But if I knew I had 10 years with a person to live the best 10 years, oh, hell yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, for sure. I don't want to get you in trouble, but the Mexico story, the part about the Mexico story that stuck out to me was the entire world dragged you, Safari hung up on you, Beagle was going crazy, but the guy you were with was lovely to you. And I was like, he didn't, he didn't seem like he judged you. And for me, the biggest thing in any relationship is I cannot be friends, coworkers, or lovers with anybody who makes me feel like I'm being judged in my vulnerable moments. The biggest turnoff ever is feeling judged by someone I'm being vulnerable with. Mm. It makes me shut down completely. So whoever he is in Mexico, he has my vote just because of that, Jason. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, um, and then the thing is, uh, I feel like me and you, Jason, we're, we're like givers. And when you're a giver, it's hard to I'm find not, somebody wait, else what? to give back. You and Jason well, are givers? What happened to me? Uh, I'm just speaking specifically to Jason's situation. <laughs> it wasn't, oh. I didn't, okay. <laughs> no, what I'm saying is it's so hard sometimes when you are a giver to find somebody that meets that matches that energy because you're so used to attracting the opposite. So Jason, you like to give, you like to do trips, you like to do this. And that person just doing that one little thing for you meant so much because usually the people you probably would just go, okay, yeah, do it. And, and don't offer anything. Well, I, I'll be honest with you since you brought that up. Uh, this past week has probably been the hardest week I've had in a long time. And you know, one thing you said, Damage, as you're speaking, I'm hearing you say something else on one of the previous shows. You said, do you ever do something and then when people react, you just lock down on saying, I don't give a fuck and stand in that because it, it's power, right? And I think, you know, I did move through like it didn't affect me, but what it, it did affect me. It affected me because I know I have a lot of people who depend on me to be great. I have you guys that depend on me to be great. I have employees. I have my family that's proud of me. I have my friends. I have my fan base that roots me on and supports me. And and I felt like I let them down. You know what I mean? And so while I was in a room, I had to go to Aruba, not just to see if I was going to figure it out with this other person. But I also went to Aruba to escape social media i plug i unplugged from my team i unplugged from everything i only talked to the really close people who are around me who've also been through their own stuff who you know shout out to floyd for stepping up and and helping me out with a couple of things shout out to cardi for being on the phone every day shout out to tiffany who i'm going to dinner with uh friends of mine who have been through their own stuff but you know were there for me and supported me i will say vulnerability is power and i think I need to get back to a place where I can be vulnerable. And I think for me, being vulnerable is saying that I did struggle with feeling like I let people down. And I will say to the person that was in Mexico with me, the fact that he was there while I was going through it, because, you know, it's different now. It's like, okay, it's a moment in time. It happens. Safari and I have laughed about it. People have gotten over it. The news is cycled. The attorneys are now doing what they need to do to deal with certain situations. But to look back and know that while I was going through that, I had somebody to continue to reinforce, you know, you're very successful. Everybody has a moment like it's, you know, and to 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 and to hold me accountable too to say like you work hard to get to where you are don't give people nothing you know i think the thing that bothered me the most was you know when i think about how they've been talking about my mother and i, I want to be very careful because i'm not going to get emotional like i'm just not going to allow myself to do that but i will say that you know to talk about my dead mother 
in the way that they have to say that I was on drugs like her when everybody that knows me know I won't even smoke a joint. Like that, I think, really bothered me. And it hurt me. And it hurt me to the point to where I had to literally center myself again and say, I'm going to give myself this trip on Aruba to work through the feelings. And then when I get back, I got a lot of fucking shit to do. And and I think having somebody on that trip to kind of support me and then just all my friends, you know, uh, that's why I wanted to have dinner with you guys. And we're still going to have that dinner because I just want to continue to be centered around the things that are elevating me and my brand, not around right. the chaos that I've created that's gotten out of control. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. No, I'm a big fan of Mexico. I don't know who he is, but the entire time you were talking, I thought about all the exes I had who, if they had seen me in that moment, they were like, well, you shouldn't have done that. And they would have shitted me to death. You were emotionally safe even during a really hairy moment. And that's a sign of love for me as a giver as well on the stage. Just want to point that out. Well, go ahead, girl. he did say, he did say in one text, like I was a little frustrated when you were drunk. And I said to him, that moment in experience was not about you. It was about me. And I have right. to stand in working through what I put myself through and not deal with how it affected you initially like i'll get to that but the first thing that i have to acknowledge you know i've been very open in my book about using alcohol as a way of blocking trauma the death of my brother the being shot the losing my mom the adopting my brother the failed relationships the weight gain the weight that i lost this year i lost in the last it, it's it's actually one year today 120 pounds of pain and so I need to stay in my truth so that way I continue to be relatable because there's a lot of people out there that are struggling with drug addiction or alcohol addiction or weight or whatever. And we are a reflection of that. We're a reflection when we go through it and we're a reflection when we work through it and we're a reflection when we have made it to the other side. I know I have seen drugs destroy my family. I have seen drugs kill my mother. So for me to be accused of being on drugs, really, it, it took me back to... It took me back to a place where I remember my mother shooting heroin in her veins, which I wrote about in my book, and then waking up out of that drug-fueled moment and calling the CPS to come and pick me up. It took me all the way back emotionally there to where I, w I wasn't even calibrated anymore. I was off my shit. I'm back on it now, but it took me five days to really like get back to me because I could not believe that somebody would actually say that about a person. You know, the other thing I will say too is, you know, at Hollywood Unlocked, I've said a lot of crazy shit. Uh, I do want to apologize to Winnie Harlow. I did piss her off because over the weekend, she refused to do an interview with us. And when I texted her to ask what happened, uh, I had referenced um, her skin condition to Roland Ray's burn marks. And I wasn't intending oh. to disrespect her. I was making a dig at Roland Ray, but wasn't thinking about how it would impact Winnie. So I've apologized to her and I, and I will apologize for that. And I've said a lot of crazy things and believe me, you know, I've had to do a whole examination over the last five days about the stuff that I do too, right? Uh, and I think the one thing that I think of is that I have not, I have sometimes, but not many times intentionally tried to hurt somebody's feelings but I have done it in reaction to somebody hurting mine. And I realized that I just don't have to do that. I just don't have to do that. And that is something that I know that I plan to go to therapy to learn more tools and how to manage because I know that I look at me as just Jason, but based on how the world reacted to my videos, I now see how people see me and I need to elevate to a place where I can appreciate and, and hold tight to that responsibility. You know what I mean? So this has been a, a very interesting week. But to the person in Mexico, yeah, I will say, you know, I do appreciate you holding me down, not trying to get a video or a moment, uh, you know, making sure I was cool and asking me if I wanted to bring that hat back to the United States and understanding why I wanted <laughs> to leave it in fucking Mexico. But yeah, it's just Aww, a memory in time. I, I want to work this. through it. I love this. We're growing right in front of the audience. I think so many times people put all of three of us in these little boxes and I can't tell you how many times. And I hate when this happens. People hit me up. They're like, Blue, why aren't you checking Jason? Number one, it's problematic to put me in charge of another adult. Jason's a grown man. Damage is a grown man. I'm a grown woman, right? So none of us 
like is a keeper for the other one. But I will say that I, behind the scenes, I have seen your evolution. I've seen your growth. I've seen you learning to take accountability. And that's the thing that I know people who've been in this industry for a long time who can never just take an L and say, hey, you know what? Let me step back and learn from this. We've seen so many careers lost because somebody's ego wouldn't let them just take the L and say, I've learned from this. So I love that you had that moment because a lot of folks who watch you and who idolize you and who are taking notes are going to be surprised and you're giving them permission to like admit that they have some growing to do too. So I love that. I love well, that. I had, I had a moment where I had to consciously say, how are you going to deal with this? Are you going mm -hmm. to attack? Because that was my initial thing, attack. And then it was like, nah, nigga, you got to take responsibility first. You, you have to take responsibility because you put that video out for it to even be a thing. So what, what do you need to do for you? What, what, why are people showing up to support you? And I think why people show up to support me and what the feedback I get from both me partnering with you guys on this show is that they show up and see what feels like a conversation with friends over real life shit. There are people out there really struggling. And it hurts me to think that there's a kid who has a mother that's struggling from addiction or a father who's struggling from addiction who's ridiculed or shamed because of their mother being or their father not being at their fullest uh, potential because of a drug that restricted them. I had shame in my life for years because of my mother's addiction and I had pain caused by her giving me up. When my mother called, the reason why I don't have an audio book is because when I drove to the studio to do it and I, and I said to myself, before I get out the car, let me read the first chapter to see if I'm ready. And the first chapter was when my mother was caught having sex with somebody as a prostitute to fuel her, to pay for her addiction. And she called the people to come and get me and the people came to get me. And when she wanted to turn them over, that experience was too hard to relive. But part of my process this week was now you're going to go and do that audiobook and you're going to face it and deal with it and give it as a gift to people. And I plan to do that this month sometime to have it available for my birthday for my for my fans. But when I think about what 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 what's going to push us all to greatness is when we stop running from the things that embarrass us or shame us and run to it to be the example that you can face it head on and you can still continue to win. I want to say thank you to Fox Soul for calling me and encouraging me and saying that you're standing with me and believing in me. Shout out to iHeart. Shout out to all my partners who made sure that I knew where they stood on the issues that they saw on social media. And it means a lot again to me that out of this chaos, more opportunities came, um, but not because they were proud of my behavior, but because they still believe in me and want to show me that they believe in me. And so I want to thank them and, and to Damage of Blue too for like, you know, making it lighthearted when I came back because I, I put on a show that it was just another moment, but it really wasn't. It was something that really affected me deeply. I'll say one more thing. Um, I, I talked about this and I think we're talking about it today. Tila Tequila, I talked about this on the show last mm -hmm. night. I also want to give space to the conversation about how to utilize my platforms to support black women more. I know that another thing I think I've done is when people have said, you're transphobic or you're, you don't like black women or you don't support black women. I just be like, fuck you. Instead of hearing it, understanding where that's coming from and then finding ways to approach it. So I've also put that on the table. I know we're going to talk about that today, but I'm just, I've been doing a really uh, thoughtful examination just about, you know, where where my life is going and I needed, as much as I didn't like it, I needed Mexico to happen for me to shake up this stability I thought I had um, and to recalibrate and to refocus and be recentered and and re and 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 recognize what the priorities for me in Hollywood unlock and this audience that I built is. And so yeah, it's been these trips have been less about the glamour I've been putting on social media. That's just for that's just for show and tell. But uh, behind the scenes, lots of conversation, lots of work. Shout out to Sham. Shout out to uh, my friend Brandon, who also went with me and spent a lot of time. Just you know, your friends they show up for you making sure going and getting coffee for me in the morning, you know, ordering the lunch for me to make sure I'm good. Like they, they took care of me and they held me down. So shout out to all of them as well. So that's it. Oh, yeah. Get that out. One of the things that I like about being on this show, particularly I've had a week where I've been reconsidering some things, Jason, we'll talk more about that offline. Um, I've been reconsidering who I give access to me. And I realized that with all the noise on the show and all the fun and the goofiness, this is probably the least stressful job I have. 
<laughs> so <laughs> I don't know well, what that says well, about my other job. No, but I, I'll tell you, I, I both of you, like both of you, um, I've made a lot of mistakes on this show. Um, I've held on to people that should have been held on to um, for what people were going to say, what people would think. You know what? I love the conversations that we have. I love the perspectives that we have. I don't even look at the numbers as much as I did anymore, even though the numbers are still there. I Because I know and feel it in my spirit that we all represent something different and bring it all together to, in, a, in one conversation. And I appreciate that. You know, um, we have to... I, I've been texting people like Charlemagne and Queen Latifah and just friends of mine to say, what can we do to cancel cancel culture? Because cancel culture only applies to black people. When I canceled little mama, I canceled her to me. I didn't mean cancel her to the world. I don't want to cancel people to the world. I cancel people to me. But I, I think that there's, a, there's an interesting thing happening because in my experience, what I saw was that while you can say anything on the internet, you can't say everything on the internet without a consequence. But I saw that in our community, we are quick to use our platforms to just spew out anything that's not even true. And that's why I decided to sue everybody this past week. You know, we're suing, I'm suing <laughs> tons of people. I'm, I'm filing lawsuits all week. I've been filing take, I mean, I've been, my legal team and my bills are going up, but my piece is going to go down when I know I hold people accountable. Why do you think cancel culture only applies to our community. And I ask you that question, but offer just the first topic that I want to talk about today. And that's Shakari Richardson. You know, she's the athlete who was supposed to go to the Olympics and um, she was uh, disqualified because she was found to have THC in her system, which by the way, I don't know why THC is disqualifying anybody from anything, knowing that it's whatever. Well, this past week, you know, something else happened where a uh, uh, a person in the media actually went and compared her to Flojo and said that she was a drug addict, I believe. Her name is, I guess she, she's she's the owner and founder and journalist from a, a business called Quillette. Her name is Claire Lehman. She's made some unfounded claims about Shikari and Flojo uh, using steroids to boost their athletic performance. Now, she took to her Twitter to make some crazy claims against the two athletes. She first accused Shikari's hair and nails are long because of the steroids. Now, I'm going to show you what she said while I talk over it. She posted this Twitter saying, not sure whether the nails are real or fake, but in case you didn't know, very strong hair and nails can be a side effect of steroid use. Now, it's clear uh, in Richardson's photos that she's wearing a wig and acrylic nails, despite her theory. <laughs> but in a follow-up tweet, Claire mentions that Flojo, she mentioned Flojo and makes the claim that the track star died uh, from uh, in her sleep because of the drugs. And this was the photo of that tweet. For those watching, she said Flojo, obviously dr obvious drug user, had the nails. She died in her sleep at the age 38 because that's what a lifetime of drug use does to the body and why it's supposed to be banned from elite sports. Now, Blue Damage, as somebody who just said how it affected me that somebody said I was on drugs, let's take it back here. Flojo, a dead icon, black icon. Uh, this girl, Shikari, who we're all standing with, who I think was robbed of her ability to go to the Olympics. Are we making it too easy for cancel culture to be cancerous to the black community? Hmm. Damage? Are we making it too easy? Uh, I think so because I feel like black people, we are the, um, we lead the culture, especially when it comes to media. So when you think about cancel culture, we are the ones to cancel because we are the ones that's usually in the forefront of the media, hence Hollywood Unlocked, hence other platforms that I don't need to name because we all know about them. So in a way, we do fuel that fire because I feel like it's something within our, our personalities and our community. We love the banter. We, we love the shit talk. We love the we love this chaos of things to go on. But it seems like we're the only ones to go all the way through when it comes to cancel culture of our own. There's a lot of people that need to be canceled outside of our culture. And no one stood up. No one fought for that. But when it comes to us, somebody you see across the street, somebody that looks like you, we're easy to write that off. And so, and I just feel like that's from generations of coming from slavery, things that happened during the civil rights movement, powers that be that forced us to go against each other as a community. So yeah, we got a lot of work to do. Do we make it easy? I would say in a way we do, in a way. I think we cancel each other by design. Um, I think damage hinted at it. It's, it's not us, it's white supremacy. We would have to have more power for it to be us. We have been told that there's only a certain amount of spaces 
for people of color. How many times have you gone to, like you said earlier, first class, right? You're in first class and the black person knows it's probably only going to be one of me in here and they see Jason, they're like, damn, it's two of us. We have literally been brainwashed to think that there's only a few spots at the top or even the middle for black people, for people of color. And so because we've been brainwashed from white supremacy, by the way, we didn't brainwash ourselves about there being a lack. Whenever we see somebody else embarrassing us oh you're making us look bad we want to throw them away because we're ashamed and that's all a facet of white supremacy so yes we are quicker to throw each other away but that is by design that is not something that we like pathologically have it within us it's something that's been spoon fed to us for generations how many times have you seen a black person and said damn they look ghetto they're making me look bad that's because when you're a person of color you're not an individual human being you are a blob so if anybody who looks like you did something bad you all look bad the biggest thing about white privilege is they get to be individuals. When Michael Phelps messes up, he gets to just be one person. When Shakari messes up, it's the whole black community who gets blamed along with her or who, or who has to band together with her because we are a blob. So yes, we have been robbed of our individuality. So of course we're going to be more likely to throw people away because we're being judged as a whole. But this is where we got to be accountable. This is where we got to be accountable. I saw more people on Twitter, not just black Twitter, but Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, and everybody canceling Monique for this bonnet bullshit than they have been canceling and dragging the hell out of this white woman. Now, I don't want us to be distracted by Monique because I think that's some bullshit too, but I also think that that plays plays into people being able to attack us and it be okay and permissible, right? I feel like Mm -hmm. when you look at what's happening, this woman literally said, without any evidence that Shikari is on a drug because of her or steroids, because of her nails and her hair, when she doesn't even understand the type of hair that she had on her head or the nails. And then to bring Flojo to dig her out the grave, right? And us not be fired up about it. I'm so, you know, I'm so annoyed at the fact that we are quick to cancel. There is more people dragging me for a rumor about Mexico, then they're dragging this white woman who's attacking somebody that was going to go to the International Olympics, the highest level of sports, and represent our country with grace. I just, I, 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 I think that cancel, cancel culture is cancerous. I think it's a cancer in our culture. I think it's a cancer caused by white people because at the end of the day, white people sit in all these boardrooms that fuel all this money into places of businesses that do not allow us a seat at the table, that do not allow us to have a fair and equal voice in decisions that affect our culture. They rob, use, and still borrow and buy our culture from us at any given moment, and we make it permissible. And I think the thing that drives me the most mad is then you have people like Puffy, who goes on social media and says, I, th- I want to shame all the white companies that aren't spending money with black media outlets. When I text you directly, Puffy, and you told me you were going to have your people reach out to me and you didn't. Stop using all of us as a part of your biggest pun. Diddy got $200 million at Revolt TV. He didn't spend a million dollars trying to bring all the other outlets into the fold or, or whatever. He created a Revolt conference and all those things to benefit him. And I still don't see the impact that they're having. Again, I'm not attacking Diddy. I'm only saying my opinion and what I see. I just have to say that I'm embarrassed. I'm embarrassed that Black Twitter has not traced every evidence of anything connected to this woman to make sure that she's canceled. Yet we have gone out and gone out of our way to hand deliver cancellations of our own people to these white people. It's just beyond sickening. And I, I, I pray that a conversation happen soon of people who have high intellect and high influence to sit around a table to talk about the effects that cancel culture has on the black community, on the black dollar, on the black family, and more importantly, on the black media that continues to tell our stories. Like this is this is beyond outrageous to me. And guess what? People are going to watch this and they go and click right over to wherever somebody black is being canceled because we don't matter. We don't even matter to us. I really hope that the the conversation about canceling cancel culture, you know, there's an old saying, don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. Like when you're throwing out a, a tub full of dirty water, make sure you take the baby out first. I think the one amazing thing that has come out of cancel culture that nobody of sound mind of body would want to go away is the accountability that it's infused into the narrative for the first time in several generations. There are people who are being held accountable. So I do think 
that we need to make sure that we're extracting the nasty and nefarious parts of cancel culture, but holding on to this newfound accountability that is finally having people have their day of reckoning that not having cancel culture allowed them to run free and terrorize their own community for decades. So we need to make sure that we separate and have nuance because accountability is sexy as hell. Canceling is not. And there's a difference. And it's so ironic because you look at it. Yeah, we're we're the ones that's quickest to cancel people. But then they say our community is the most forgiving, the most open, the most welcoming. And it shows you what at, at the core what the black community is. We're forgiving. We're welcoming. We're we're homey. So whatever this cancel culture thing is, it can't be natural to who we are as a people. Because when you really look at the core of who we are, it's all about nurturing, loving, and accepting. So I do think we need to get back to what we were as a core, and we need to rebuild our home because we're not able to handle our problems internally because we don't have that home anymore. We, you, you say uh, white people are able to be individuals, but we move as individuals. We need to start moving as a unit and as a culture again. So, but but and as black we people, we're world. also our, our, we're, as black people, we're strong. But as a black community, we're fragile because we keep allowing people to see the cracks on how to get in. Just buy one out. Just invest in one. Just just get this one to bring them all. They don't look at the fact that if you come with one, you come for all. If you come to one, you come to all. Where, where does that sense of pride? You know, the other thing with black media, I used to try to bring all the creators and all the owners of all our platforms together to get on one page and they all got their issues with each other. And you know what I woke up one day and said a couple weeks ago, I'm done. I'm going to advocate for the black voice in media and welcome anybody to the table, but I'm not going to spend my career trying to force people to get on the same page. I'll continue to say this. Your children who you say you love, you do not love them if they are black and you're going to let them inherit a world that does not allow them to have equal opportunity or equal voices or can just label them drug addicts. And if you support people who do that, media outlets like this woman or the one that I'm getting ready to sue to do that, you're a part of the problem. You cannot like me. You cannot like my opinions. You cannot even like what I've built. But if you can take a step out of my opinions and see as a black gay man in America, I built something from scratch that employs people and that touches people all over the globe and has done as much good as it may have done some some not so good, then for that, respect that. But to try to attack the fabric of that is to attack everything black that does it. You know, I also want to say shout out to Megan The Stallion, who gave a shout out oh. to Hollywood Unlocked on the red carpet. Megan, you know, and I'm saying this to Megan. You know that I have been very critical of your choices and how you have accessed black media. It was echoed by Charlemagne at the Breakfast Club. I want to say to you personally that I appreciate you showing that you're not taking it personal and that you gave us a shout out to the BET Awards. And, you know, you're always welcome to come here. I know the message has been sent to you. And uh, I, I do I do appreciate being able to have differences of opinions. And I've been hard on Megan. I've been very critical but I've also said that I think she's a uh, she's a beautiful girl and she's a nice person. But I think nice people and beautiful people can also go astray or be misled. And so I hope that at some point we get to have a reconciliation because she is uh, she's somebody that I do want to see win. You know, uh, as much as as much as people may not, not have thought that. But back to the original topic. Hashtag protect black women needs to also stand for Shikari. But I'm going to show you another case. So the other day on Gagging with Jason Lee, I talked about Tila Tequila. And this is somebody that I used to hang with back in the day. It's an Asian woman that was a reality star on MTV. She did some dating shows or whatever. And she was always caught up in this controversy. The last time I really hung out with her is when we went to San Diego and she got into it with uh, Sean Merriman. At the time, she was having sex with Sean. I'm not saying allegedly this was happening because I was there. And she was a part of a sex culture, sex party thing, where there were a bunch of people just having sex with a bunch of group of people. I did not go to that event, but I did go with them to San Diego. Uh, Sean sent a limo for us. We rode out there, whatever. And I saw how she then went and did this whole thing on TMZ where she said he choked her and beat her, this and that. And it looked fake. I didn't believe it then. In my opinion, it was fake. I think she was a liar. I distanced myself from her because she was toxic uh, at the time. She was fun to party with, but then I saw the toxicity and I saw the racism that I thought was mm -hmm. racist in how she handled Sean. Well, now she is under fire because she's posted something that went viral and she's talked about black women and she drug our God into it. The God that I know we've prayed to much more than she has. This is what she had to say. Now it was 10 minutes. I'm not going to show you 10 minutes. I'm going to show you a little bit. This is what she said. Let me read to you what the Lord God says, because remember, there's a lot of these, you know, you will know a man by his fruits. There's all these like black women claiming to be the bride of Christ and many church people out there claiming Jesus was black. But to their shame, 
The shame follows them everywhere. You'll know a man by his fruits. Look at Africa, and now all the African women are bald-headed. And this is what God says about that. The Lord says, the women of Zion are haughty, walking around with outstretched necks. You know how they're always like this with the attitude, like haughty, haughtiness, okay? The women of Zion are haughty, walking along with outstretched necks, flirting with their eyes, strutting along with swaying hips, you know, all that twerking with ornaments jingling on their ankles. Therefore, the Lord, the Lord will bring sores on the heads of the women of Zion. The Lord will make their scalps bald. In that day, the Lord will snatch away her, their finery, the bangles and headbands and crescent necklaces, the earrings and bracelets and veils, the headdresses and anklets and sashes, and perfume bottles and charms, the signet rings and nose rings, the fine robes and the capes and cloaks, the purses and mirrors and the linen garments and tiaras and shawls. Instead of fragrance, there will be a stench. Instead of a sash, a rope. Instead of well-dressed hair, baldness. Instead of fine clothing, sackcloth. Instead of beauty, branding. Mm. <laughs> so, All right. so many things. So many things wrong with that. I loved a show back in the day called Celebrity Big Brother. I spent a lot of time in London. And there was one year that Tila Tequila was on there. And she got kicked off for being a Nazi sympathizer. So I just need you to recognize who is speaking, right? And to be a Nazi sympathizer, as an Asian woman, she already has so much self-loathing within herself for her to even be in the circles that she's in, that what she thinks of black and brown women means nothing to me. Also, the gag is if she and I both took out our tracks, I promise you my hair is probably longer than hers. I think she's mentally unstable. And I'm not saying this to like be mean. I actually have a cousin who struggles with, with mental instability. And he, when he went to the hospital, the first thing they told us to do was take away his Bible. Not because anything's wrong with the Bible, but when people are mentally unstable, they tend to cling to religious dogma. So I think she should be less concerned about our edges and more concerned about getting some mental health because she is Jason, not well. I am tired of people using black outrage as a way of promoting anything. I haven't heard of this woman in so long. Now you jump out with a YouTube page and the first thing you do is come at black people because you know, when we get fired up, we get you something to talk about. And I'm just, you know, it's cool we talking about it right now, but after this, I don't want to speak on this crazy little woman anymore because that's what everybody's doing today. Everybody wants to use black outrage to promote whatever the fuck they got going on. This is a perfect example. The first thing she does to come out of her mouth is talk about black women. Knowing yeah. black women are most... I'm not going to say fiery. That's not even a word, but we're responsive on Twitter. We're responsive in all the media platforms that she's trying to promote. You're trying to get some, some conversation going. We're going to give it to you for a little bit, but after this, you're done. You're cut. No one's ever going to talk about Tila Tequila again because we weren't for the past 10 years. Where the fuck she been at? Well, I will say, I know that Tila used to do drugs because I used to be around when she did cocaine. And I don't know if this is a drug thing or what this is. What I will tell you, the, I try to find the positive in everything. The positive that came out of this for me was now me understanding, not to say that I didn't understand it before, but to understand the vile attack on black women. The fact that she felt this comfortable to say something mm -hmm. like this publicly. We all have a responsibility as a fabric of our community to lock arms and deal with it. Not just ignore it, and not talk about her. Deal with it. How does that happen? How does how does that happen? I may not have all those answers, but I could tell you this: it's making sure that people understand the ignorance that we don't go and subscribe to her YouTube channel, that we don't give her those views, that we understand if she has a uh, if she's a part of any organization, don't spend your money with them. You know, write letters, make phone calls, make sure people aren't attending or buying into this te tequila tequila. Fact. I don't know if she was on tequila. I don't know what was happening during this rant. But what I do know for sure is I I see, I see it. I wish our fight in protecting black women was more than a hashtag. I feel like it's it's a moment in time for people who just want to have something to post on their social media. When there has to be organizations built, people invested in who can lead 
real conversations and actions or legislation around ignorance like this. I don't know. I don't have all the answers, Blue Damage. I could say that when I saw the video, because I did watch the full 10 minutes and oh, I didn't yeah. watch it on a YouTube channel. I had somebody rip it from another page that was on there and send it to me because I didn't want to give her the view, but I did watch it and I was just, I, I was just taken aback. But then I think about it. I take a step out of that and I look at the story we did a minute ago about Shikari, right? It's just too permissible to do and say anything you want related to black people, black women. Uh, but here's the thing though, and this is where oh, I'm struggling, but I'm going to keep it a buck since we're having this Kumbaya day and we're all being so transparent. I will say this. I love all black people, even the ones that I wouldn't want to come to my house for dinner, right? I don't like all of y'all, but I love all of y'all and will fight for the rights of all of y'all, whether I personally want to break bread with you or not. As a result, I have a hard time sometimes bonding with women, black women, because when they start saying N words ain't, you know, talking about men, I'll step in and be like, hey, I'm actually not cool with you talking about all men like this because I have so many men in my life who are amazing, who don't fit that description. You can't talk about white people talking about us when you're destroying the men in our community. And we all know, and I've said this before at dinner parties, I'll say it in, on TV. I think because black women are so aggrieved and are so much pain, the same way if you had a misbehaving child that you feel bad about the fact that they were abused, you wouldn't want to discipline them. I think a lot of black women are not held accountable. So I try to hold my sisters accountable. Conversely speaking, I think a lot of black men sit by quietly while black women are being disrespected. And when our own men don't speak up on our behalf, it makes it much easier for the rest of the world because of a thing called patriarchy and misogyny. And so for me, I would just love if Protect Black Women wasn't just when we're doing a show like this or wasn't just when we're out in public, but when your boys are talking crazy about black women, be like I am with my sisters and check your boys. We have to do this within the community because I'm so tired. I'm so tired of having bitter black men talking about black women behind the scenes and then saying protect black women in front of the camera. And I'm tired of bitter black women talking about black men behind the scenes, but then marching for George Floyd. We have to call bullshit on ourselves. It starts and, at home. And let, me call, and let me call bullshit on myself because I have criticized black women who are black celebrities, but that's why I talk about black people, right? So I'm going to always be, I'm always going to keep it 1000. However, I think that I need to really be mindful of my approach when I do talk about the issue. So that way it's coming from a place of while speaking facts and being blunt, not being mm -hmm. intentionally destructive or mean spirited. Um, I have right. gotten into it with people where I have said some nasty things. I mean, somebody called me a cocksucker. Of course, I'm going to throw shade and do whatever. But I think that there's a there's an approach to do it where I can still stay mindful of my responsibility and obligation to my community and still throw the shade that I need to throw the shade and hold people accountable. So I can say to your point, Blue, that I have to be one of those people that you talk about. I have to walk the talk. I have to be mindful. You know, I just two, a week ago ripped apart somebody on my other show, but I did that with the intention of setting them up so they can go and violate a bunch of laws and they were dumb enough to play into it. And so even that show, I'm like kind of cringed at watching it because I knew what I was doing in my mind. Uh, and but but that's not what the audience sees. And so I have to be mindful. Right. I mean, and also acknowledge that blue damage our community. We're not going to be perfect. We're going to make mistakes, you know, mm -hmm. but I do agree. There are a lot of people who in the public eye, they say one thing. I've been very critical of Sean King. I don't know if he's white or black because his birth certificate is still under question. He's blocked us because we asked the question. But this is a white man, alleged white man or a black man, I don't know, making a lot of money off of our black community. And I don't know what money he's putting back into organizing legislation. He talks about it, but I don't see it. And I don't see us caring enough to hold him accountable. I don't see him doing interviews where we can sit down and ask him the hard questions. Yet here we are. Every time he gaslights us with a black body on the ground, we're there to rally behind him as our voice. He ain't my voice. Now, um, some more black folks in conversation. Mark Lamont Hill, we all know him as a, a commentator and as a talk show host. Uh, and Judge Joe Brown. They got into it oh, over God. Bill Cosby getting released. Now, I didn't even know Joe Brown was still out here because the last time I saw, he was going viral for being allegedly under something, right? So Judge <laughs> Joe Brown... Him and Mark Lamont Hill got into it, baby. They got into a heated debate over the disgraced comedian Bill Cosby's recent release from prison. Brown appeared on Hill's TV news show, Black News Tonight. By the way, Mark, you follow me on Instagram, but you didn't invite me to your show. 
I didn't I did pay attention to that. Mark, who's a professor at Cosby's alma mater, Temple University, invited him on the show for a discussion on the issue. And after the two fired oppose after the two fired off opposing tweets in a segment that lasted over 15 minutes, the two went back and forth about Cosby and his abusers. And while they agreed in the interview uh, that the legal manner of Cosby's assault conviction was indeed unfair. They differed on what Cosby's 2005 deposition uh, meant. And, you know, it was just a lot for the world to watch. I don't know if you guys saw it, but um, Mark mm-hmm. asked if Cosby should still be held accountable for his predatory behavior. And Joe responded, quote, what about these women being accountable for their own behavior? They were groupies, sex, drugs, rock and roll, sex, drugs, rap, sex, drugs, basketball, baseball, football, movies, television. See, it's called being a groupie. We forgot that term and what it meant. What and does then it also mean, ca- Mr. Joe Brown? Also, what does that called, mean? Wait, then he also called them bimbos that came to hang out at the party. They hung out, they got drunk, they stored the lines of blow, and they have a good time. They use all the hall closets to give head, bathrooms to get down, and you go in to get your coat off the bed, and they're laying on top of it doing somebody see. That's what that's about. This is what's fucking me up. Oh, sorry, for Kurt. This is what's messing me up, Mr. Joe Brown. So you're telling me these girls was down the party and do all of this, but still there was somebody there drugging women that was trying to have fun anyway to do whatever they got to do. That's where this all flaw it's all these flaws in this story and this, 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 uh, what is he reminiscing about this classic time that he used to party in? Joe Brown, what the hell were you doing at these parties? Brown, you was just walking Joe. in, getting your coat, just getting your coat. You wasn't, you wasn't participating at all. I was getting my coat. I seen these groupies walking around, but I knew I was going to be a judge. You sound like you missed the good old days, Mr. Joe Brown. What's going on over there, man? What's up with he that? Is, he is gross. He's actually the perfect example of the kind of man I was talking about, right? Who is supposed to be this beacon of justice, but we know that behind the scenes, Brown Look at Joe is problematic. I'm going to give you guys a cheat sheet about how to be on the right side of history so you never have to look back at footage and apologize to your kids. Don't ever use the term consensual sex. There's no such thing. There's sex and there's rape. Non-consensual sex is just rape. It's not sex anymore, right? And when you look at it from that lens of there's sex and rape and there's no in between, right? You cannot compare somebody using their sexual free agency. I could fuck 20 dudes if I want. I still don't deserve to be raped. They're not the same thing. They're not interchangeable. So you bring up someone's sexual proclivities as an excuse for them being sexually assaulted and raped is disgusting. And the sad part is women aren't the only ones who are being raped and molested. So there are Mm -hmm. men who you think are going to agree with you who have been molested and who are watching this and they're like, see, this is why I don't open up. If you're going to talk about women like this, what's going to happen when I open up? So I think he has missed the ball completely. He is not a mental giant. The fact that Mark Lamont Hill even dared to breathe the same air as him. I've worked with Mark Lamont Hill. He, He is brilliant. And let me say, and let me say this, because this week and on top of all of this, (laughs) Jesus. Bill Cosby's planning a Bill Cosby is planning a comedy tour and amongst other things and I know that the people are going to be torn over that. I'm not going to go and watch it because if he makes one joke about sexual assault or a pudding pop, I'm not going to know what to do with myself. But I will say that I I didn't agree with everybody trying to cancel Felicia Rashad this last week. Again, I'm going to say that she stood with Bill. They have a personal relationship. She knows him and believes one thing about him. I I I may not have agreed with her, and I'm sure Blue and Damage, you probably didn't agree with her either. But Felicia Rashad is and will always be a black icon. I'm not going to ever forget the the days and years I sat in front of the TV and watched her and watched what she represented. And even though my mother wasn't a black woman, to see a strong woman in the house, a strong mother, and on top of that, grow up and by my grandmother, understand the importance of having a strong black woman as an example like her. I just feel like it's it's not fair to cancel her. I think she should be held accountable. I think that she shouldn't represent Howard University if they don't believe in the same beliefs that she has, and that should be taken from her. But that's where we should hold each other accountable, not cancel. I saw everybody exactly. online talking about cancel Felicia Rashad. You going to cancel Claire Huxtable? Are you crazy? Mm-hmm. Nah, not with me. I'm not. They her husband was the prototype. Like, she's the reason why I talk like this. I grew up watching her cussing out Elvin, and this is why I'm on the show right now. So I would be a complete hypocrite to cancel the bl- blueprint, but I can be disappointed. I can't I can hope that she'll see the think pieces that are being written to her from a place of love and grace trying to explain things to her. I think we sometimes forget there's a different generation that didn't know any better, and they're learning super late in life. And we have to have some grace for having teachable moments without throwing away our elders. We need our elders. No community makes it without their elders. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah, and I think we have to be able to have conversations like these. I think Mark Lamont Hill, who you said, I think, you know, interviewing Judge Joe Brown was just crazy anyway, but he's so brilliant and so smart enough to be able to highlight the ignorance that exists in our community. And I think so in a way that allows for these type of conversations. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm just really excited at the fact that we're having these responsible conversations. Um, I don't know about you guys, but I am just exhausted with how much stuff is going on in the world right now. Like we just opened up and it is, I mean, Meek Mill and Travis Scott fighting at the party with the white folks, Judge Joe Brown talking about the bimbos on Mark Lamont. I mean, like Claire Huxtable getting canceled. I know Mercury retrograde is happening, but I'm in the house. Like when I tell you I'm not traveling and I'm locked down with guns and alarm systems and sirens and the police on my phone, I am staying away from the world. It is a crazy place right now, but... The one thing that I will say that isn't crazy is our audience who keeps showing up for us. We appreciate you. And just from the deepest place in my heart, I thank you for giving us the opportunity to have these type of conversations. And please keep in mind that we, all of the people we talk about, us, all you, we're all going to fall short. But there's nobody counting on us to fall short more than the other people. I'm going to leave y'all with that. You define who other is. I know who mm -hmm. it is. Bye. <laughs> Bye. All right, look, that was a great show. And make sure you keep coming back because we got all types of amazing interviews and topics that are going to make you go crazy. Uh-huh, that's right. That means like, subscribe, do everything you need to do to make sure you stay up to date with what we got going on. And ladies, stay tuned in because you know I have your back. And listen, make sure that you're commenting below because even though I say I don't read it on the show, that's all I do when it's over. Peace.